Um, given the size of the meeting, given the knowledge we have among ourselves, that we all know each other, I have some remarks. I'm not going to read them. I'll put them somewhere if you want to read them. I'll just talk from what I know of what we are doing and the partnership that we call dear. So, first of all, let me start by welcoming you to Nairobi. It's good to see you in Nairobi. And uh, by wishing you a happy new year, we are still at the beginning of uh, 2019, so that is uh, very important. It gives us an opportunity to think through how we come through this year. So, um, that said, I think we have a new kind of here as other industry. I've worked with Ifri well before, before today. I've had a chance to work with what we do, to experience the type of work we do in the field, and to see how we can actually influence the type of decisions people will take and the type of outcomes we get. So I don't think there's a better time to be talking about our partnership and how we engage than what we are doing today with regards to the challenges we have today. Um, my, uh, just to put it in the context, let me go a little bit back uh, with, with regards to what I'm talking about, with the work we've done with IFP. In the past, but the work I've done personally with IFP, that I feel becomes the anchor of how we see this partnership with regards to the challenge we have at hand. I, I keep telling my team here at Agra how IFP has been central to driving the things that we see at county level, the whole modeling perspective that we've developed with regards to informing how countries make their decisions has been extremely helpful. I mean, I lived and experienced that in my own country, Uganda, where we still came in and helped us design the kind of, you know, helped, helped us shape what we needed to do. And to be honest, we did it to the letter and we saw that it was extremely productive. We are trying to replicate the same experience in other countries, and we know that other countries have also, have also lived that. So basically, I'm just saying that that type of work is very critical, mostly because our countries have many challenges around capacity uh, and thinking through. Not everybody is an economist, not everybody knows how to model stuff, but also not everybody can put it in the type of context that you put it in having studied the different options the country has. That was really an experience that I wanted to share. But I know that you know exists out there that you have the capacity to do. That we've signed up to to continue taking to other countries with in the work we are doing. So that's really a huge anchor for me. Now in Agra we also have a different type of expertise. We do work on getting solutions to farmers. We've developed our capacities to get solutions to farmers. I think the challenge that we are both facing at this point in time is the fact that what we know that works isn't delivering anymore, or isn't working for people anymore. What you told Rwanda would work for them is definitely not working today. What we said would work with regards to the technologies we are delivering is definitely not working. In fact, we have a significant population of Africa today, probably about 30%, that is hungrier today than it was five years ago. Right? So the challenge we are meeting for here today is critical. The thinking through what we need to do, the timing couldn't be better. I was just looking at some of the numbers people gave me and I felt, I, I, I even was surprised at how the things have, surprised, have, have, have evolved. I didn't realize that just 50 years ago when we were trying to think about, when we were talking about all these other things, in 1950, Africa's population was only 221 million. Today it is 1.2 billion. In another 50 years, I which I believe, I hope I'll be here, it basically in my lifetime, we will, we will be 5 billion people in my lifetime, right? Can you imagine that, moving from 220 something, 220 something million to 5 billion people in a space of about 100 years? I'm assuming I'll live to 100. 
<laughs> Can you imagine that? That's just, it's, it's, the issue is not that we are increasing pollution and demanding more from the environment. It's also the rate at which we are doing it. The rate at which we are using what we are using. That is scared. So FAO says that with that type of operation, we need to increase food by 60%. But think about it. We are already having challenges feeding ourselves today, especially here. But even those who are feeding themselves, we are already having challenges of how they are, the footprint they are creating on the environment. How much we are extracting to be here. We are already having challenges. We are actually creating a vicious cycle. We try to get more, we create more problems, then it gets more difficult to feed ourselves. So, I don't think it could have been. This meeting, again, like I said earlier, this meeting would have come at an earlier time, a better time. We need to worry about how we feed the people we have, because we have a responsibility to do that. Between all of us, we have a responsibility to ensure that whoever is here has a good livelihood. But we also have a responsibility to do that from an ecosystem perspective that recognizes that we have a responsibility to ensure appropriate ecosystem services are functioning the way we found them. While feeding ourselves, while growing our populations. I belong to a number of um, um, commissions, institutions that are trying to do different things, boards that are trying to come through on these things. And very, I very deliberately say to this because of the concerns that we have. I am a, we've signed up Avra to be a member of FOLU, the forum, is it forum for Land Use Coalition? Food and Land Use Coalition. Use Coalition. We are a member of that. And I insisted that it was interesting that the Food and Land Use Coalition, which is a great idea, trying to do great things, had all Basically, all the institutions that were in that were from the north, most single institution from the south, and the south is most impacted by what we find So, Abra is now a member of the Food and Land Use Coalition, and the issue is we are trying to understand how do we become part of Thinking through how we reduce, we continue growing what we need to grow, we don't squeeze out the ability to produce food and to feed our people, we don't squeeze out the ability to have nutritious food. But we also worry about the things we're supposed to worry about with regards to the environment. We need to continue worrying about that. There's also the new climate economy. The new climate economy thinks big picture around how economies grow while worrying about how we impact the environment. That's huge. Because environmental, the things that are impacting our climate are way beyond the, the, the agricultural system that we talk about. So not worrying about that is, would be a big mistake. But also how adaptation is put in context in all those, uh, in, in that particular field and in these uh, countries where mitigation seems to be more important than adaptation is something that is important to us from where we are sitting. So like I said, I joined this mostly because I feel like representation from this continent is just, not, our voice is not being heard. We are, we are doing very little to impact the environment, at least for now. And yet we are suffering a huge problem. 20, of the 23 countries that suffered climate change in 2017, two thirds were from Africa. Two thirds, putting a significant number of people, over 30 million people, out of food security. Right? So this is something that is very critical. <coughs> the last one I wanted to mention is the Global Commission for Adaptation. The Global Commission for Adaptation was formed sometime towards the end of last year, really with a, a very huge concern around will we be able to meet the SDGs given climate change, given the pro proportion of people that are smallholder farmers today, that need to actually increase their food, that need to actually secure their livelihoods, will we be able to be on target? And, what is the, and given that these are the people that are actually suffering from the impact of climate change, what, is the, what can the commission do to ensure that people understand that we need to do investments differently with regards to the smallholder farmer landscape? 
going back to Rwanda again, just for purposes of humor, one of the things that I always, I always find interesting in the development perspective is how you all, if you will come and design, say, okay, we need to do this, we need to ensure that we are doing this type of investments, it is fire agriculture, and then the country will take that and go to one of the manufacturers, submit a program, $100 million, yes, we have it, we are going to move this program forward, except it is something that is going to happen for over the next 10 years. And then, I, for me, from a development perspective, I ask the question I always ask. You're trying to move 100 million people with 100 million dollars over 10 years. If we look at per capita investment per year, can that actually translate into poverty reduction? So sometimes you look at these things and you say, what are we trying to do exactly? You know, so it's very important that as we try to move these programs, as, if, as you do your modeling and think about the things that can impact people, you need to worry about these things. That's the, the thing that the, the, the Global uh, Commission on, on Climate Adaptation worries about. It worries about what type of investments do we need to do to move smallholder farmers forward faster? How can we do it within the context of SDGs? And I think we have a role here as IFPRI to help define how that gets done. If you're worried about smallholder farmers, the way we are, if we move our cups of institution and say, okay, me as IFPRI we do this, we as Agro do this, if we're worried about the same thing, the bottom line being there's a whole population of people out there that if we don't do something about it, they will actually permanently fall out of a possibility to, to be food secure. Their children will be food insecure. One time I was writing an article for on something rural girls. And when I started writing this article, it, is, it appeared somewhere in uh, Chicago Council or something like that. When I was writing this article, I actually remembered something I had never thought about. When I was in primary school, one of my, my, uh, my classmates, had to fall out of class, she got married. Imagine primary school, that means we're 13, 14 or whatever, married daughter. I went to visit her a few years later, she had three children. I realized that actually her children were going to be, now when I talk about it, uh, when I think about it, she didn't make it through primary, but her children would not even be able to read and write. I realized that it was going to be even worse for her children, then it was for her. So if we don't take responsibility and start shaping and start saying what is acceptable and what is not acceptable, and you as if you have that, you have you don't believe, you don't know how much more you have in being able to provide those models and show direction. I'll give you another example. I'm using, I hope I'm using my time right, because it's my time, right? <laughs> I'll give you another example. In, when I was in Rwanda as Minister of Agriculture, if we started producing the hunger, what do you call it? Hunger Index. Hunger Index report. My country, Rwanda, had one of the highest levels of malnutrition. Coming from the genocide, and all these things. Really, hunger was unacceptable. So I, I, but every time we talk about investments in agriculture, people are like, ah, you know, ah, services, services, industrialization, all that. So I have to think about what is it that, what, how am I going to help these people understand how bad this problem is? So I was extremely happy when if we started coming out with this report, and my country was like number 100 out of 110, and my country was number five out of Five meaning it was the poorest in nutrition. So what I did, I started sneaking this information to the minister class. Yeah, I said I would call the the the, the media and I said, guys, I need you to publish this information. And the moment this information got out that the one that was the poor the you know they had the poorest score in nutrition, basically in Africa. One, two things were happening. One, 
many of the efforts we were doing, we were not, like, we were not correcting information in the way that it could be used. So there was no, no data that was showing what we could do, what we were doing already. Like we had this one cow poor family program that was becoming important uh, to address nutrition, but we, we were not keeping the data in a way that anybody could access it. Two, there, there was more we could do. And we were not doing it because we didn't know the nature of the problem. So when this when it started coming out, <coughs> I would go to government meetings, we call them cabinet, and they get bashed. Did you see the paper? Did you see the Minister of Agriculture? Did you see what came out in that paper? How did we become number f the last country in the, on this in the East African community to be performing with that type of thing? How can we be the, the last? How can we be the last country on the continent? How can we be the, the last in Moreva? Of course, what they didn't know is that I had leaked the information to the media. <laughs> I'm like, okay, so I know we are the last. I'm sorry, I know we are the last, but I need support. I need help. I need resources. What can I do? You know, so we, we, we started, based on that, we put in place a five ministry program chaired by the Prime Minister to deal with nutrition. We started working on the issue of data. So they were like, but you know, we have this and this and this and this. Well, so the data is not there. When they go to the Institute of Statistics, the Institute doesn't seem to compile this information. So that became action number one. Where is the data? Put the data together. Action number two. What is the Ministry of Family Planning doing? What is the Ministry of Health doing? What is the Ministry of Agriculture doing? Five ministries all together working with the public. If this data had never been available, I wouldn't have been able to have anything to, to use. I wouldn't have been able to take anything to government and tell them, this is the state of affairs and this, we need to take action. We started putting actually programs in place specifically to address that. So, what we would like to, to see from where I'm sitting as a global commissioner, what do we need to do for smallholder farmers? What type of action would make a difference in the next 10 years to ensure that smallholder farmers can actually get out of what we know is coming, can actually stay above the waters as we try to fix our environment? Because even if we do, and whatever we do in the environment, Definitely, you know, this impact is going to stay for some time. It probably will get worse before it gets better. In the meantime, what do we need to do to ensure that these communities stay above the waters? Number, one. Number two, what do we need to do to fix what we've done wrong? What do we need to do to correct the, what the, all the things we've done wrong in the environment? And why am I posing this challenge here? Because, again, as if you look at what we have, you look at the state of affairs, you look at what is possible, you look at the different options. The reason we are meeting here today as IFPRA and Abra should give us that opportunity to start looking at Abra, you focus on smallholder farmers and how they are We as IFPRA, we focus on options of how things happen. So I'm basically challenging you to say, this is a great opportunity. You're calling this a lab. Let it be a great opportunity of a starting of thinking that we can take to other countries. A starting of thinking that we can use to influence how people think. Just like I used some of your reports, one to influence how my government invests in agriculture, two to influence how my government invests in nutrition. We are taking that to every government we work with. That experience, we are taking it to be there. With us to our different countries. How can we that I hope will help us define and shape how governments invest in just what we want to do in Kenya, using your reports to help shape the, the Kenyan uh, investment plan. And we are going to be doing that through our MOU in a number of other countries we work, we work with. The challenge from an environmental perspective is, given all the effort, efforts in the time around and now, how do we use your capabilities, your modeling power, and your resources to help shape what type of actions we need to take, whether it is within FOLO, whether it is within AGRA, whether it is within new climate economy, whether it is within the, new, the Global Commission for Adaptation. How do you use my presence in all these things to ensure that we get this knowledge, word, and experience and options for action to the right tables in, the, in these different
So again, I welcome you to Nairobi. I'm excited that we are talking about this. And I, I'm looking forward to the type of recommendations that you come out with and how we take them forward. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, so I'm just going to give a, a brief overview of the knowledge lab and, uh, and, and how, well, one, one point is how it came about. Um, and it, it actually came about, sort of started off in December 2017, the IFPRI Board of Trustees sort of lay out a challenge to IFPRI to, to think about three big problems in, in Agnes and, and food systems. And, and uh, asked the, the IFPRI staff and, and across divisions to, uh, to come up with sets of ideas. And uh, there are three. There's a knowledge lab on climate resilient food systems. There's food industries for people and planet. And there's an initiative on urban, urban nutrition and special needs for urban nutrition. So the knowledge lab uh, is, is one of, of these things. And the knowledge lab is motivated by um, it, this observation that, that Agnes was, was talking about, that these food systems are influencing the environment of the planet, uh, livelihoods, Nutrition, and, and this is a really big share of the whole SDGs, uh, and uh, and all and all of those uh, initiatives, such as Global uh, Commission on Adaptation. Uh, a robust food system is a really powerful vehicle for achieving the sustainable development goals. You know, on the one hand, on the other hand, uh, weaknesses, lack of resilience, vulnerability within the food system. Uh, is, is, is a real problem, especially in the context of a changing climate. So, so that's, um, that's why we're here and what we're doing. We're thinking of, of resilience uh, in terms of an ability to, to withstand shocks, climate, weather, economic health, um, how those relate back to uh, the environment, uh, and at various levels, households, institutions, small institutions, but also at, at the broader macroeconomic level. You take a country like Kenya, where middle-income country with a very high share of agriculture and GDP, you know, right around a third, uh, and, uh, and a big dependence on agricultural exports for, for almost all of the export earnings in, in Kenya, big share. And so it's, it's not just, uh, you know, it's important for, for poor households, but it's macroeconomically important uh, as well. And so that, that kind of resilience we want to talk and think about. There's three pillars to, to the knowledge lab. And uh, one is, is two-way integration of expertise. Uh, this is a, a recognition of all of the capability uh, that exists now within developing countries. I was a Peace Corps volunteer 25 years ago in Morocco. And it's, it's just a different world today than it was 25 years ago. And we have to be uh, aware of that. Um, we have a, a research program, which is really what we're going to be talking about today. So I won't, I won't go into that so much today, but, but we'll start with it. And then, and then partnerships for impact. I'm going to go through those, uh, each one. And I'm going to start with pillar two, just so we know what we're talking about. Uh, uh, sort of start with as a, as a, uh, a structure. Um, so we have three research, broad research initiatives. Uh, we, like AGRA, or technology-based uh, institution. We think the technology can be, we know the technology can be part of the problem sometimes, but we think it can be part of the, the solution. So we have leveraging new technologies as one part. Uh, facilitating social change is a second. Uh, when a new technology is introduced, it causes change. And uh, how that, that plays out in terms of welfare, uh, this can have a gender dimension, it can have an institutional dimension, it can have a generational dimension. Uh, but also, so if this is, these technologies are going to be delivering the kinds of outcomes that we want, then we have to be um, dealing uh, at, at that level as well. And then we have a part on assessing country resilience, which is a broader perspective, bringing in modeling and so forth to look at uh, uh, what's happening at a policy country-led uh, legal regulatory uh, framework. So within each of these, we have a, a series, and we're going to try to touch on many of these points uh, today in the various talks uh, about, okay, where, where are we going uh, with, with uh, new technology? We think in the tech, new technology area, uh, these information communications, remote sensing technologies have real 
promise, and we'll go into a couple of those areas with, with different kinds of, of, of looks. Um, energy systems are key, powering irrigation, how, how do you get rural electrification, how do you deal with this unbelievable change that has happened in wind and solar power, big opportunity for Africa, how do we, how do we take advantage of it, both in terms of rural development but also in terms of, of overall power. Um, and, then, and then the traditional note on, on bio-innovation, I will have a talk uh, by, by, by Margaret uh, today. And, and you know, in the past, uh, they're, they're, we're moving, there's GMOs have been a big source of debate around bioinnovation. We now have these gene editing techniques, which is a democratization of, of, that, of that process. And uh, so that's, that's uh, 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 things that are now going on inside uh, National Agricultural Research Services. Um, you know that's happening, and it's really important that the legal, regulatory, and other, other frameworks are put in place in order to take advantage uh, of that. In terms of facilitating uh, social change, uh, we've got a lot of work in, in management of common property, and we're going to hear that, about that today. ICT enabled extension, uh, the other way to, that could be here or here, um, but uh, in a way to move uh, things forward. Uh, and, and, we have a lot of work in, in gender and you know how, how these gender relations, how power uh, relations work out, and how benefits are distributed in the context of change. We'll talk a little bit about uh, adding things up in terms of, of modeling. We have a series of frameworks that, that we've developed that we think are quite appropriate and, and useful for really driving <coughs> the, the change that, that Agnes is, is talking about. And for, um, you know, our ambition is not to influence one $100 million project that runs over, over 10 years, because we know that that's not enough. I mean, we're not going to sniff at it, um, but, but, uh, but, but that's, that's, uh, uh, there's a need for a, a strategy, right? And we need to show people who define these strategies what the options are and what the trade-offs are and what you might get with one strategy versus another. Uh, and we have a number of frameworks that are, that are set for, for that, um, and also being able to develop work that really drives out of bio, uh, biophysical phenomena, water, soils, crop health, uh, because this is where sort of the fundamentals of climate change start to emerge uh, up and, uh, and, and, and impact us. Uh, we won't talk about it today, but we've done a lot of work on linked energy planning. Uh, 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 modeling. Uh, actually, uh, Johannes from, from NDI uh, has done a lot of that work. He'll talk a little more in the climate uh, impact side on, on rivers and uh, potential energy uh, as well. So all, all this is, is coming. That's the second pillar. Um, but the first pillar is, is, I think, really important as we're looking at this long-run phenomenon and as we're thinking about having impact, getting, uh, 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 dealing with, with a long-run phenomenon. And uh, one is this sort of two-way ex integration of, of expertise. And this is the recognition, basically, that institutions in developing countries aren't interested in just receiving a really smart report. They want frameworks, they want models, they want the ability to do this kind of analysis. So we're working very hard to try to engage with institutions uh, uh, such as AGRA, uh, who have represented in the room African Economic Research Consortium, which has a big agricultural economics program, uh, and, and reaching out uh, is, is a really big part on that. And this, uh, I think this observation uh, is, I see it over and over again, the more, the more skilled an institution is, the more interested they are in augmenting their skills, the less interested they are in just receiving aspect is uh, there's been a lot of work in Africa, elsewhere, and uh, if we drop in with a, with a framework of ours that doesn't build on the knowledge base that's inside the country or the, or the region, then, then we're making a big mistake and we're not going to have a policy. policy. So, so that, that's one area. One way we hope to do that, we're trying to get this going, is to do some distance learning in the modeling framework such that our um, uh, the research that we do uh, is instead of sort of backfilling the capacity building as we're doing the research, we're 
bringing people, we're, we're making our frameworks uh, more familiar at the beginning, and we can generate genuinely work in a more uh, collaborative way. We have some model, we have some methods for that in the modeling area. There are other areas where we think uh, there, are, there are things we can do. We believe that there's a considerable space between what a person learns when they come out of, say, a PhD program and what they actually do, particularly in, in the modeling space in terms of using models, using data, and, and being able to exploit uh, frameworks. And we want to facilitate that, that framework. Um, so that's, that's one element. And this really fits up with our goals. You know, we, we have capacity building objectives. Um, we understand that policy impact often comes out of long-term relationships. You don't just read a report and say, oh, we do this. Um, it has to be uh, uh, developed. We have useful frameworks that we want to, to push out there. Uh, and, and we want this effective uh, uh, research collaboration. Um, so we've done, we've already been in touch with a fair number of people uh, uh, talking about this, and I, and I think that will uh, move forward. Um, our partnerships for impact is, is the last element. Uh, uh, we want to not just write a report and then look around and say, okay, who's going who's to pay attention to this? Uh, we want to look forward and see, okay, what is the impact channel that, that we're trying to, to influence at the beginning? We have a number of examples of this uh, in extension in terms of the whole program on biosafety uh, is, is oriented this way. Um, we're working with, uh, right now, uh, the Foundation for Ecological Security in India, the management of common property resources and, and, and how uh, uh, games might facilitate that. Um, the National Economic Development Agency of the, of the Philippines has come to us to help develop their uh, nationally determined contribution uh, for climate change. So we want to, in the work that the Knowledge Lab does, have this notion of where it's going and, and what the impacts uh, might be. Let me see. I think that we're running slightly behind and we have a, a full schedule, but um, I would suggest first, if there are any quick questions on that, we can, we can do that. Uh, are, there, are there any things uh, or, or items that we want to touch on for, for the rest of the day? And, and second, I think it's useful if we just quickly do uh, an introduction in, uh, around the, the room. Why don't we start with, with Boaz, this table, and, and move around. My name is Boaz, I'm on for opera, I'm here with Boaz. Yes, good morning, my name is George, I'm here with Boaz, I'm here with Boaz, I'm here with Boaz. They're having a very good time over there. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know what they have been having for <laughs> breakfast. <but. laughs> Uh, 
Good morning, everybody. My name is Alex Sabinto, also live free. My main area is Cognitive Agriculture. Good morning. My name is uh, Carmen Mugen. I work for Sales Taxation Agency. Good morning, Vice President of the Constitution International Programs, and the one that's the Ladies, gentlemen, here. The far back? Oh, good David, I work on science policy, seed systems, extension, and a number of other problems. Morning, my name is Samuel Akera. I work for uh, UNDP, uh, Atari <laughs> Index, and the Intergovernmental Authority on Development. And I'm a program specialist uh, for the <coughs> and, uh, uh, primary the Thank you. Joseph Mwanga, <coughs> working with the SNV. And I'm playing this and Good morning. My name is Sebastian Mudanga, executive in my office. <coughs> Good morning, my name is Ray Carroll, and I lead the soil fertility and fertilizer systems at that. Good morning, my name is Nick Kamala, I work for the Dutch Embassy on Food Security. Good morning, uh, my name is Johannes Kensadik, I work at the Nalbez Initiative, the Secretary of Office in Tebe, and I'm a water source analyst. Good morning, my name is Johannes Safa, I work with the USA funded East Africa Trade Investment Hub. That I'm the director of agriculture and agribusiness. Okay. Uh, yeah, please, first. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Go. Go. Um, my name is Eileen. I support her class communication. Uh huh. Okay. She's the yeah, director of communication. Yeah, so I'm Claudia Ringler with IFPRI, and I lead the natural resource, resources management theme, and I do a lot on water and irrigation as well, and a bit on energy, because they happen to be linked. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, my name is Simon Chucho. I work with DIZ on our drought resilience program in Marsabit in Kenya. I am Hassan from Agra, leading the work on resilience in Agra. Good morning, my name is Amanda. I'm head of gender at Agra. Good morning, I'm Bayako. My name is Barbara Kramer, and I'm a research fellow with IFBRI. Most of my work nowadays is focused on agricultural risk management. Good morning, my name is John Machaya and I'm the country manager for Environment Tech. And I'm again Channing Arndt, I'm the director of Environment Production Technology. And I think we'll just move into, we have a series of short presentations and then some, some discussion. George. Uh, Channing, can I ask a question? Just yeah, okay, yeah, sure. sure. While you move forward. <laughs> um, you have to shout. Yeah, um, thanks for the presentation. I mean, it's to sort of maybe to frame and orient us through the day. Um, so you presented a framework which is really interesting. Um, I wonder, as you've discussed this with different colleagues, have you, understood, have you identified blind spots in the framework? I think Agnes in her presentation really spoke quite eloquently about previous blind spots with, you know, advantages and then blind spots that didn't help us. And I, you know, I, I would take an example of the impact model. For a very long time, the impact model did not have trees in it, did not actually have the environment. And yet, a lot of government policy was driven by that model. As we look at this today, what's missing? Have you, you know, and is some of the function of today to identify some of those blind spots? Or even in your explanation on partnerships, uh, it seems the partnership would come back to the central hub. But is that invalid? I mean, Agra itself has gone through, I think, uh, an evolution of what it now considers to be an appropriate green revolution for Africa. And in my country, India, uh, we were moving away from the green revolution pretty fast. So the question is, what are our blind spots? Where are our confirmation biases? Because if we're presenting the wrong kind of knowledge to people, we are going to drive through the you know, authoritative knowledge the wrong kinds of decisions. And I think that's a critical um, uh, danger that we have to take on board. Absolutely. And, and, and that doesn't apply, you know, just to this. This, this is uh, obviously completely general across all of, all of the research or, or advocacy um, that, that we, may, we may do. Um, uh, 
I suppose it becomes quite basic, right? That uh, that uh, deliberate decisions are, are better than than uh, on average than haphazard ones, uh, and we're trying to head towards deliberate decisions. Uh, in terms of your 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 example on on the impact model, um, you know that that's exactly correct, right? and and we will never have a model that does everything. And, and, and it will and we'll never have one that'll be that'll be perfect. Right? So this is one of the reasons for this two-way integration of expertise, right? And making sure that A, we're gonna do work with consumers of, of models so that they know what are the strong points and what are what are the what are the weak points. And we're also planning on doing work with, with producers of models. I I've, I've wandered around uh, Southern Africa and, and here uh, today, saying, okay, you know, we now have the ability to, to tear out parts of impact. And so we could say, okay, we're going we're to look at, at Southern Africa. And uh, one of the reasons to do that is we know, and you should know, that the global model representation of Southern Africa is the representation you get from a global model, which is full of assumptions and compromises and so forth, that we would add to that and, and so when, when we pull it out and look, we work with local institutions and, and experts, hopefully we can do we can do even better. How do we have to do that? Could I yes, I like your question about what are we what are the blind spots? And I think that's one reason that this has been framed in terms of resilient food systems. There have been the the systems aspect of it. Production has been treated separately from marketing and from consumption. And I think one of the important things in looking at resilience is bringing all those together. By doing so, for example, the importance of energy um, as one of those linking things came. It was one of the things I learned by doing that. But the other thing I want to raise here um, is that this is not just about models. Mm -hmm. With all due respect to the very strong power of models, but for example, we've worked for a long time on integrating gender into models, but the data are not set up that way, and the models are not asking the questions that you get from a more bottom-up perspective on gender. So, the Knowledge Lab is not just going to be, um, you know, uh, Channing put up the distance learning on modeling, but we're also promoting a blended learning, distance learning plus on, on a whole bunch of gender tools and the Women's Empowerment in Agriculture Index and how that can relate in. So we're, and, and I think this, the second session after this next one, we'll be talking about how do we, Agnes very rightly pointed out that no amount of external funding is probably going to do this unless we are tapping into the investment of smallholders themselves and the innovation of smallholders themselves and that bottom-up perspective. So I think one of the things to me is how do we link this top-down and bottom-up to really make a system that works. So that's my. Yes. <laughs> okay. uh, thank you very much for those important points. I think they help us to kind of shuffle. I think that's my first key my to be charged. So our session is uh, looking at uh, leveraging technologies in a country transformation in the climate stress of Africa. And uh, later on this, we have a series of presentations. These are short, and uh, we request each one to take between eight to ten minutes. And uh, I request you to keep your questions at the time of the end of the discussion. So, without much ado, I'd like to call upon the first presenter, and this is looking at the potential of being data represented by the team of the police. Well, thank you for the introduction. And 
thank you uh, to Agnes for the remarks she gave at the beginning because it sort of set a, a, a serious challenge for us, I think, today, uh, things to think about. And, and she also challenged uh, me, at least, to remember my roots in the whole agricultural side. And, uh, my roots got developed in Kenya, actually. I came here in 1987 to work in uh, agriculture and dry land areas. In fact, I lived in a small village uh, 25 kilometers from Marsabit. So I know Marsabit uh, very well. I, well, I used to know Marsabit very well. I'm sure Marsabit now and Marsabit of 1987 are very different places. But uh, in any case, it inspired me to go on to study agricultural economics. But I've always had in my mind, whenever I do analyses, I think to the village that, uh, that I lived in and worked in, and it motivates me, uh, particularly in regard to smallholders because a lot of times we're thinking improving commercial agriculture, uh, at least implicitly, and not so much about smallholders. Now my topic today is the potential of big data. Now I don't know if any of you sometimes get intimidated by new terms, but everybody seems to be talking about big data these days. And so me, you know, I didn't, I wasn't handed an official definition of big data, so I've always been a little bit shy about using that term, big data. So I thought we should at least get over the shyness of that term and to get into the topic a little bit more. So what is big data? We don't really know. We have some ideas, but nobody can really agree what big data is. It's a catchphrase. People use it because it's, it's the phrase that's used these days. Um, the, the definition that I found that, that seemed reasonable has to deal with large data sets that are, that are harder to use, that maybe a laptop would, would be struggling a little bit with. Uh, but more than that, uh, I'll, I'll tell you in a moment. Um, sometimes uh, we, we think of uh, the Facebook data scandal where, uh, where it possibly was used to throw one or more elections. And, uh, and you can think about, well, um, that was big data. But we're not gonna use Facebook in this talk. That's not the purpose of big data in terms of agriculture and food security. So mostly what we're gonna talk about is remotely sensed data. Now, a lot of us have been thinking about remotely sensed data, or at least know about it. So now you too can be an expert on big data because you say, oh, remotely sensed data, of course. And that's one aspect, but it also brings in uh, more of the telecommunication side of things. And it can also include things like uh, cell phones and how to use cell phones as, as part of analysis. Now, why are we now talking about big data? Why is it the buzz? Well, part of the reason it's the buzz is because in the past, while there's been satellites, there have not been that many satellites. And so there's been some data, but not that much data. Uh, so there's five spot satellites up there, two Landsat, two MODIS, two Seabirds, which are Chinese of Brazil. Um, there's all these, well, like seven or eight fine resolution satellites that can they can fly around and you can zoom in on a certain area. But now there's this new effort by Planet, planet.com, and they have a ridiculous number of satellites up there. You know, we went from about a dozen or so, maybe 20, to now they put up 300, 300 satellites up there, 150 are like taking daily photographs of land. So now there's this potential for massive amounts of satellite data looking at land. So that's, that's part of the reason we're starting to talk big data. Because, wow, it should be like flowing in. We should be able to do something with it. And also, you know, UAVs or drones, that's also coming in. It's a, it's a new thing, relatively new thing. And that can be used to observe land. And land takes a lot of big data. So I, I often think from the researcher perspective of, um, getting me data. But uh, Jiao Ku, who is one of our colleagues at IFPRI, and he is a co-leader of the uh, big data for the CG system, um, 
he uh, was speaking with him, he sent me some slides, and he thinks of big data not only as us receiving input, but the ability to send things to people. And so extension services pushing out to cell phones is part of, of big data, at least as the CD system is now defining big data. And so using remote advisory services, there's all sorts of potential for, for improved yields, for improved advisory services, for, for taking agriculture, even for the smallholder in the small villages, to the next level. And I think, uh, I think we'll probably hear more about this later on. So I just wanted to give you uh, a few examples of big data. Uh, I'm not presenting papers on this, I'm just giving examples. Uh, here's an example that I considered big data. I had daily weather data for 31 years for the entire globe. That's a lot of data. And, uh, and uh, it didn't take me so long as it took the computer to, to calculate all these things, but it, it basically condensed it all down to monthly data, and then I took yearly statistics, and then I ran regressions. And what I was trying to see... We can't see what you Oh, I'm so sorry. Okay, let me, let me scoot back here. Like yeah. Troubles, I got to rush up to push you up there. But, um, so this, these are um, statistically significant temperature trends for, uh, for Africa for the 1980 to 2010 period. So you can see that there's been considerable warming in lots and lots of uh, places in Africa. And uh, it was a simple thing. I did a regression at each point in space to see if there was a trend line or not. And if there was a trend line, was it significant at 90% uh, you know, significance? And then to what degree was the trend? So these are, these are things that you can see here. Um, there, the, you know about climate models. And climate models are used by the IPCC for, for the reports, for detailed studies. And so these are just... Uh, four climate models from the AR5, and this is showing um, changes in annual rainfall for four of the major models that were used. And you can see that there's vast differences, but again, this is big data because there were quite a few models, and, uh, and uh, processing it for all the different years, again, another use of big data. Uh, at IFPRI, we produce uh, a product that, that attempts to take agricultural statistics at uh, whatever administrative level they're available and distribute the crops to where we think they're growing and tell what we think the yields are from those agricultural statistics. So this, uh, this particular, what, what is displayed here, is for rain-fed maize, and the one on the left um, the one on the left shows percent of land in each cell that we think is in rain-fed maize. And the one on the right is the yield that we think, roughly, that we see on a typical year for rain-fed maize. Um, another example, we, were, we took those climate models and we ran them into a, a crop model and we wanted to see what is the uh, effect on yields that climate change will likely bring. And so this is, this is the result of that. It reflects uh, the climate of 60 to 1990, which is sort of the baseline that people have been using. We'll probably upgrade that to next, another year group for the next set of models. And then uh, the 2040 to 2069 is where it's projected. But you can see uh, that there's going to projected large <coughs> shocks on rain-fed maize across a, a lot of West Africa, for sure. Some in Southern Africa, and even, even uh, the rest of Africa, except there's, there's bright spots in Kenya here, and some bright spots in Ethiopia. And uh, I can't tell you all the details of what's driving what, but a lot of it has to do with temperature, because maize is very sensitive to temperature. And, uh, and if you're already at the critical level, and you boost it by two or three degrees Celsius, it has a big effect, adverse effect. Uh, land cover. Uh, we've, people have used uh, satellite data to generate land cover data sets. I think my big point on this one here is that 
you have different organizations trying to do different uh, land cover data sets, and they tend not to agree. And that's really frustrating because that means that, that there's such a great deal of uncertainty right now on what's on the ground. So it creates problems uh, for everybody, for researchers, for people who are trying to generate agricultural statistics because of these things. Um, here's the use of remotely sensed data. Uh, these are areas that are not easy to get in, uh, in Syria. And you can see very clearly from remotely sensed data how agriculture is different from year to year to year in Syria. So even though uh, this is not an interpreted uh, photo, uh, we don't know actually what crops are growing in each fields, you can at least see, visually even, where crops are growing.